in Acts again. Acts, that's what we've been in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. We've been in Acts chapter 9 uh, three times, at least the three times I've been preaching, um, because we're in a series of Acts, amen? And how many people know that God's word is the living word, amen? And God can bring an infinite amount of message through the same scripture because his word lives, amen? Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, I'm just going to read verses 15 through 16 and then tell the story. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. And as I do, I want to thank this great choir. My goodness, thank you so much. Amen. Amen. This great band and ushers and videographers and sound folk and custodians and everybody. Thank you all so much for making ministry happen. Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16 says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. My God, my God. God. You may be seated in the presence of God. Lord, help me to bring a word like only you wanted to be brought. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to speak to you from the subject, the significance of nobody. The significance of nobody. I know we always want to talk about somebody's, but today we're going to talk about the significance of nobody. Anyway, as you know, we've been going through the book of Acts. Today, we're going to talk about the effect of what the Lord can do with just one man, a man he chooses, a murderer, a man who had some small notoriety, but in the grand scheme of things, he was just a nobody. In some ways, he just was like you and like most of us, some education, some influence, but nothing really special until God got a hold of him and he used this man to turn the world upside down. Dive with me into Acts chapter 9 where we're going to meet this man, a man who murdered Jewish Christians, who put fear into the hearts of the disciples because of his zeal to stamp out their religion. And even after he came to Christ, they still were scared of Paul. He was a truly scared man, but we most of the time we don't think of him like that because we often just talk about him after the great change God made in his life. This cold-blooded killer name was Saul. He was out murdering people and going and kill everybody and was a ranking high official and had the permission to kill anybody he found in the way. He began to go murder all these people and all of a sudden God sees Ananias and told Ananias, I need you to pray for Saul. And and Ananias said, what you talking about God? Because this man trying to kill us. And if I don't say Marco, he won't know. Come on somebody. He can't find me. He can't see. His eyes is closed. You want me to heal this man who's trying to kill us? And, And he said, but Ananias, hold on, slow your roll. I am God and I've chosen him to be my chosen vessel. And I'm going to show him how much suffering he got to do in my name. And it said, but then and then God blinded Saul and he couldn't see. Now look at this. Can you imagine the experience was like, what this experience was like for Paul? Here he was hunting down these Jews who thought the Messiah was Jesus of Nazareth. Having them in prison, stoned like Stephen and murdered. And now he comes face to face with the risen Christ and realizes that he was wrong. Oh, have you ever realized you were wrong? Not mistaken, but he was flat out dead wrong. Jesus is the Messiah and he is risen from the dead. And he has called you out for everything you've done against him. And just to be sure you get the message, he blinds him for three days. Oh, everything Saul thought he knew and believed, at least initially in these three days, was wrong. He was blankly sinned. He had blankly sinned against God, murdered his fellow Jews like uh, with near reckless zeal and was now completely blind, helpless, afraid, and mixed up on so many levels that Freud would not be able to analyze the meltdown. Saul was a mess. He was spiritually concussed. And he had to think about it for three long, lonely days. I doubt that many of us 
have ever been in his shoes so wrong on so many levels that it's hard to fathom. Responsible for murdering innocent people. Think of that. It's like Osama bin Laden had been beheading Christians his whole life and then all of a sudden he had a vision of Jesus Christ and overnight becomes the Billy Graham evangelizing the entire Muslim world. That's how crazy Saul was. How do you wrap your mind around that? And how do you treat someone like that if you were Christian and he comes to you for help? Do you trust a murderer? Ooh, he got quiet in here. And then Ananias tells him about Jesus and heals him. This is the stuff people have nervous breakdowns over. Massive delusions and that up in your world, a complete and utter breaking point for the hardest criminal. You are face to face with God and you have been killing those he loved with reckless abandon. He stops you, gets your attention and then heals you for a very special mission. And now what if it happened to you? Oh, what if God chose you to be an instrument, his instrument? Is it crazy? Why not? Saul, a total nobody like you or me who God raised up to do something significant for him probably thought the same thing. Now consider Paul's, I mean Saul's wild experience on the road and tell me it's still crazy to say that any one of us could have been chosen too. So how does God select someone insignificant like you or me or Saul, a real nobody, even a murderer. That's why you can't worry about when people talk about you and say you call yourself a Christian and make you feel bad because you fall short of his glory because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. Don't you let anybody make you feel bad. Don't you let nobody talk you out of your calling. Don't you let nobody talk you out of being used for God. Saul was a murderer. He had killed women and children. He murdered anybody he saw that was coming against what he felt was the right sect of religion. Oh, that's why you got to be careful about so folk that get so religious that they'll kill somebody in the name of Jesus. Oh, y'all know what I'm saying? You got to be careful of folk that build their whole ministry up and tearing down other people. If you come to me talking about somebody, I give you that Baptist thing and tell you, it's all right, baby, we good. But don't come to me talking about another pastor because you're going to talk about me. Because, of, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? You can't let anybody down you because Saul was a murderer, but God used him. Let's talk about somebody else he picked because sometimes it's hard to wrap our mind around Saul. But look at how God picked the smelly shepherd boy. Jesse's runt son who grew up uh, to be the king of Israel. Remember Samuel, uh, God got mad at Samuel and said, look here, Samuel, you need to stop mourning Saul. I don't choose him anymore. I need you to go to Jesse's house of Bethlehem and go find and anoint my king. And, and then Samuel said, hold on now. Saul, this is not the Saul we're talking about right now. We're talking about Saul the king. Saul said, no. He said, what if, if I go to his house, Saul going to try to kill me? So he said, no, go there and tell him you're making a sacrifice. So then Samuel goes to the neighborhood and they say, hold on, here come the priest. Do you come in peace? That's what they said. Do you come in peace? Yeah, are you going to give us a good sermon today? Is it good news today? Is it going to make me happy? And so, so Samuel said, yes, I come in peace. I come to make a sacrifice. Went to Jesse's house. Jesse begins to bring his sons out. He brought out Enab. He brought out Abinab. He brought out all these people. And they began to say, no, that's not who I want. And, and God said, no, you looking at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. I need you to keep on going. Keep on looking. And then he got through seven boys. And then Samuel said, is there one more? And Jesse looked around and said, there's one more, but he keeping the sheep. He's the insignificant one. The one that, that, that ain't the one I really pay attention to. He's out there keeping the sheep. And he said, look here, I can't leave until you bring him here. And I'm sure they were looking at Samuel like, Samuel is crazy. He didn't came in here, ate our big piece of chicken, and we didn't fed this man. And now he's talking about, he trying to find David. David ain't been to nobody's school. David is an outcast. I don't even look at David like he's my real significant son. I done sent him all my best sons out here. And now you telling me to go fetch David? Go on and get the boy and bring him in here so this Negro can go home. They bring in David, and God immediately says, this is the one. This is the one. This is the one. And he rises up and anoints David as king. Ain't that amazing? 
Some of you all thought you was on your last chance, but I'm going to just give you some hope right here. He had brought seven of his sons in, and now he brought the eighth son in, which is David. Eight stands for a new beginning. Can I talk to some people out there who have been down and out for so long, and you've been ostracized and looked over, and people been calling you insignificant? I'm here to tell you right now, baby, I'm going to prophesy over your life right now. I believe God is about to pick you up and turn you around and put your feet on solid ground. I'm believing God is going to give you a promotion. Motion. I'm believing God is going to heal you. I'm believing God is going to take you to the next level in your life. The problem is, can you just wait and not faint in your well doing? Can you be patient like a tree planted beside rivers of living water that will yield fruit in its season? The problem why you're getting frustrated, you won't wait on your season. You're not insignificant to, to God. You may be insignificant to people. You may be a cast out and a scandalous person. You may be an outcast, but God has made you fearfully and wonderfully. So David was a kid, nothing special. Really, he had a good heart though. But Saul was a murderer with a bad heart. Two extremes. It's mind-boggling what God's criteria is for choosing his vessels. Oh, I know you thought you was looking for qualification with your seminary degree. I know you were looking for your doctor degree. I know, I know you were looking for somebody who was all polished. But, but God has a way of choosing who he wants. And he doesn't worry about the criteria. He'll choose somebody with a good heart. He'll choose somebody with a bad heart. He'll choose somebody with gifts. He'll choose somebody without gifts. He'll choose somebody educated. He'll choose somebody uneducated. He'll choose somebody beautiful. He'll choose somebody ugly. Baby, I don't care what it is. God does not have a particular criteria. Criteria. All he wants you to do is say yes. And you can just say yes whenever he calls you. Yes, whenever he wants you. If you just step up when he calls you, that's the criteria. The criteria is saying yes. Oh, let's just go down the little brief resume uh, that uh, David talked about his own life. Uh, you know, he had already killed Goliath by this time. But we're going to go to 2 Samuel 7, 18 through 23. I'm reading old school version, so you might need another translation to keep up with me. The king, David, went in and sat before the Lord and said, this David talking, who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you also spoke about the future of the house of your servant and this decree. Sovereign Lord, it's for a mere human. What more can David say to you? So amazed, talking in the third person. For you know your servant, sovereign Lord. For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you and there is no God but you as have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make name for a name for himself and to perform a great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. We all know David, what he did for God in the Old Testament. He was a superstar for God. And in the same way, Saul went out uh, to being the most important figure in the New Testament, devoting his life, bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. This was a very big deal in the post-resurrection period because before Cornelius came to the faith in Acts chapter 10, all the first Christians were Jews. David was amazed and talked to himself about himself in the third person the same way Saul did the same thing when he was Paul. I knew a man one day in the body or out of body. I can't tell. God know it. Do you understand? I don't understand why people get the big head when God begins to bless the ministry or bless their business or bless their life. When I look over my life and see how messed up I am, I sit back and be like, God, how in the world you use me to get done what it is you get done? You got to look at yourself 
and know you messed up. Look at your life and know you sinful. And you got to just step back and uh, and be like, God, why in the world did you choose me? You know I'm messed up. You know I fall short of the glory of God. You know I ain't right. You know I'm uneducated. You know I don't know how to speak like everybody else speaks. You know I'm, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. God will use the insignificant people in the world to confuse the wise, to make sure. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying, God. Uh, let me just read what I wrote calm myself down he was a superstar this, and all the Jews from Peter on down assumed that the gospel was strictly a Jewish message from the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob it was their Messiah their law, their temple their religion, so when Saul believed and became known by his Gentile name of Paul and took the message to the rest of the world it was a very big deal especially for most of us in the room today but it was nearly a deal breaker for many Jewish Christians yeah he changed and flipped the world upside down. A nobody, like a smelly shepherd kid. He, he did all these things. Peter got mad at Paul because he began to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul said, I know you walk hand in hand with Jesus. I know you saw him in his manifested physical state. But I met him on the road to Damascus and I know what he called me to do. Ain't it funny how people try to tell you what God called you to do? And you know what God called you to do? You got to stop listening to everybody else's opinion and do what God has called you to do. And stop doing what man has called you to do. The only person that has the author that is the author and finisher of your faith is God Himself. If God didn't tell, remember when God got mad at Abraham, at, at, at Adam and Eve in the garden. He got mad. You know, you know what he said, Brother Hawkins? He, he, they said, I'm naked. And, and God said, who told you you were naked? Which means if I didn't tell you you were naked, you shouldn't know. Oh, y'all hear what I'm saying? If I didn't call you an alcoholic, don't you call yourself an alcoholic. If I don't call you a whoremonger, you better, who told you you weren't worth nothing? Who told you you was insignificant? If I didn't tell you, you shouldn't even think it. God called you your omega. I ain't trying to hype you up. Not your alpha. He called you your end. Not your beginning. He calls you the good parts of you. Not your setbacks and your infirmities. He calls you by your destiny. Not your mistakes. He calls you by your finished product. Not when you're on the potter's wheel with all of the breeze and mess in you. Ooh, he doesn't call you a marred piece of clay. He calls you the end product of the vessel. He doesn't call you by your failures. He calls you by your successes. Anyway, so who was this Paul anyway? What do we know about him besides he killed Christians? He lists his short resume in his letter to Philippi. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to the zeal of persecutor of the church, as to the righteous which is in the law found blameless. He's like, I did all this stuff. I know I messed up, but at the end of the day, I'm covered with the precious blood of Jesus. I know I may have murdered your mama, I may have murdered your daddy, but I need you to forget about that because I was wrong, but now God has picked me up and turned me around and used me for his vessel. I know I was a Pharisee. I know I went by the law. I know I killed some folk, but at the end of the day, God has called me. If Paul can forgive himself for murdering folk, what can you forgive yourself for? Can you turn around and stop doing the ignorant stuff you do and make yourself a, a valid man or a, a woman of valor in God's kingdom? Can you stop doing what it is? See, God don't care about your past. In fact, your future don't care about your past. The only thing your future care about is you leave your past behind and press toward the mark of his holy call. Stop keeping people keep tied up in their mistakes. Stop keeping people tied up in their yesteryears. It's hard to be a pastor. You got to begin to let folk do stuff who going to probably kill you later. 
But when you begin to look at how God has used you and even in your mess and sometimes your mess may not be public like everybody else mess. But when you begin to look at yourself and see how wretched you are, I know I make some trustees upset every now and then. I know I make some deacons upset every now and then because sometimes I sit somebody down and God is saying, no, give them one more chance because I'm asking you to give them another chance because Lord, no, I didn't give you a whole bunch of chances, Brother Maxwell. And so after we make a decision, I say, you know what? God, if he can use a murderer if he can use a whoremonger if he can use a liar and a cheat he can use somebody oh y'all don't hear me no he wasn't great like Caesar Augustus King Herod yet God chose him and made him great we may never know why he chose Paul but he did I don't care he chose him See, the problem is we keep trying to figure out God and God and already told us in Isaiah that our ways are not his ways and his thoughts are not his thoughts. Some of y'all been wondering for six years why in the world did they choose that crazy Negro from Atlanta, Georgia to come up here? You still don't know why. I don't know why either. So if I don't care, you need to stop worrying about it because I, if I can't figure it out, I know you can't. I see myself every day and I don't know why in the world God was able to choose me to pastor a great church in Newport News, a place I ain't never even heard about a place I ain't even applied for. Somebody sent my resume out there. And oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying? <laughs> Stop trying to figure it out. The world may never know. It's just like how many licks it takes to get to the center of the two year old. <laughs> the world may never know. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and that's exactly what we do. I wonder why they call him. I mean, didn't bite him. <laughs> anyway, just bite to talk about for. I don't know why I choose. I'm just going to bite that Negro. <laughs> Something wrong with me, you see? Jesus. I'm trying, Lord. Please make me be right for one more minute. Just two or three more, Jesus. Anyway. And what do you think happened? <laughs> I've always wondered if there was an untold story behind the scenes of this great man of God who was great originally, who was not great originally. I think there was something more, or at least I like to think that there was something more anyway. I like to think that somewhere, someone who knew Saul, who was also insignificant, maybe an old babysitter or a neighbor or a friend, made an extraordinary effort to pray for him. I mean, really pray for him. Don't think that something moved. Don't you? You think something moved God to pick him out of all the Jews in Israel? We know God looked at David's heart and chose him. Something moved God to pick a murderer? How do you explain it? What if there are chapters of the Bible reserved in heaven for us to read when we get there? Like the Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, radio snippets. Maybe some secret prayer chapters that show behind the scenes stuff. Uh, how he used people. Folks, we'll never meet until we get to heaven. Or who with fervent prayer showed that the burden of all the greats we read about. Gideon, Deborah, Mary, Jonathan, Stephen, and Moses. I know, I know it's a what if game, but imagine what if. I'm not talking about heresy here. The scriptures are complete. I know that. I'm just trying to stir up your, your faith a bit. I'm making, I'm, I'm talking about letting your faith imagination run wild with the possibility of God's work in the behind the scenes story that were influenced by prayer. <laughs> An insignificant nobody who just prayed, maybe an invalid who could do nothing at all but sit there and pray for years. Certainly someone was praying for Saul. He was a worldwide impact. It's too great for, oh, you know it, come on now. He was a murderer. All of a sudden he turned around and began to work for the good side after he was trying to destroy the good side and began to switch teams. Come on, somebody. Somebody had to be praying for him. What if you could be that person for a new Saul? That prayer warrior. See, if you knew that you could do anything for God, if money or responsibility were not an issue, would you do it? What dream would you choose for God if you knew you could not fail? Would you become a writer, a pastor, 
a missionary, a philanthropist who gave millions to the gospel and evangelist? What would you do as insignificant as you are for Jesus Christ if you knew you could not fail? If he chose you to be his instrument? I'd like to challenge you to consider doing this. If you're up for it, take this challenge. Just say yeah. All right, cool. Pick someone you think that is insignificant and pray for them to make a big impact for Jesus Christ. I mean a big impact. I don't mean no little impact. I want you to take it upon yourself to pray for this person all the time, but not just today, not for just a month, not for a year. I'm asking you to pray for them for the rest of your life. Pray for them to become significant. Be that significant prayer person behind the insignificant Saul who becomes a significant Paul for our generation. Maybe it's an enemy of Christ. Maybe it's your enemy. Maybe it's a murderer like Saul. Maybe it's a crooked politician. Maybe it's your son or daughter. Maybe it's your crabby neighbor or the kid in your English class. Maybe it's a rock star or an actor or a scientist. Whomever it is, let your faith imagination run wild and run free and zero in on them with your prayer life. Pray that God would bring them to him if they do not know Jesus. Grow them to spiritual maturity and use them to make a significant impact for the kingdom of God. Will you accept this challenge to see what God would do? I ain't hear that many amens. Try. It may be crazy, but so is what we see happening in the book of Acts. Do you see what's happening in the book of Acts? My goodness. God performed miracles left and right in his book, and he wants them to continue today. See, some folk think miracles stop in the book of Acts. No, that's when they really started the most. That's when Jesus said, I'm going to give you a comfort, the paraclete, the advocate, in the form of the Holy Spirit, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things, all things through Christ who strengthens you. You will cast out demons in my name. You will do greater exploits in my name. And why is the church so dead in the 21st century? If God gave us the power of Acts, if God gave us the power of the Holy Ghost, if God put a part of himself in us to live in us, why in the world are we not making a greater impact in the world? Ooh. I'm going to tell y'all something that I get to preach. Will you accept it? Will you become significant yourself in a quiet, behind-the-scenes way and pray for a soul in your life to become a Paul? Sure, there will be some days you might forget, but imagine what could happen if you drench someone insignificant in prayer for years and years and years and years. Won't you be Radical today by committing to pray for someone to turn the world upside down for Jesus. My prayer is that you will. That hundreds and thousands of you would do that. Wouldn't that be something? To get to heaven and meet the people whose lives were changed by your prayers. For this Saul to one day become a Paul and thousands of us actually did it. Do you understand that? See, we be worrying about our reward down here. Come on, somebody. I, I, I'd rather live in a shack down here and have a big mansion in heaven. John said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it was not true, I would have told you. And if it's many mansion, all of them ain't the same size. I want my mansion to be bigger than yours. Just keeping it real. 70, 80, 90 years is a short time to be living in a shack. But it's a long time if I'm living forever up there in one. Amen. Oh, uh, y'all understand. You got to begin to understand. You got to begin to stack up the intangibles. You got to be able to stack up the crowns for praying for people's salvation. You got to be a witness and bring somebody out of the darkness into the marvelous light. You need to be an evangelist. You need to be able to share some gospel to some people on your job. Share the gospel to your family. Stack up your crowns in heaven and stop worrying about your treasure down here. God going to bless you down here anyhow if you begin to worry about the things in the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Anyway, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds far-fetched, but it was this man, an old man who's a great writer now, and he began to say how he one day, some lethargic way, he said, I'm going to go back and visit all the people that I've seen that I came up when I, when I grew up. And so he said, I'm going to go down, and he went to go see his old teachers, and one teacher he was scared to go see. He was scared to go see him because he was so bad in her class. And he said, I'm going to go see her anyhow. And he, he was hoping almost that she didn't remember him. 
he went in and, and introduced himself. She said, I know you. He said, oh, Lord, you do? She said, yeah, I pray for you every day. He said, for real? He said, yeah, I pray for you every day because I knew you was going to do, I knew God had his hand on you and you're going to make a great impact in life. Now, this is a famous writer who done wrote millions of books and, 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 and sold millions of copies. And he was talking about how this woman, he said, what, you pray for me every day? Every day, he said, what you mean every day? You, I'm, I'm in my 80s and you older than me. He said, yeah, I pray for you every day. I pray for you today. And he said, what? And he began to say, there's no way in the world he think he would have been a writer that he is if it was not for her prayer because he wondered how his life turned around. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Do you understand that how significant you are when you're praying behind the scenes? Oh, y'all ain't what I know good and well my mama, my daddy, my Sunday school teachers, my brothers, my sister, everybody had to pray for me for me to get up out of Georgia Southern and out of Atlanta to become a preacher. Ain't no way in the world I became a preacher because I sure wasn't praying to be one. I wasn't praying to be no pastor. People say, I, well, somebody told me when they were three years old, they wanted to be a pastor. I'm like, I don't know if you called or not, because I'm telling you one thing. I, one thing I ain't pray about being. If it was not for the prayers of my uncles and my cousins and my Sunday school workers and my pastor and people I came in contact with, I know I wouldn't be here. Come on, somebody. Y'all see, y'all see a part of my mess spill out right here when I'm talking. Come on, everybody. God, you don't know how many people have been behind the scenes in your life if it was not for God on your side and people praying for you in the background. There's no way that you would be where you are today. There's no way you would escape being on the back of the bus. Us. There's no way you would have got through Blessed versus Ferguson. There's no way you would have got through Brown versus Board of Education. There's no way you would have got through Jim Crowism. There's no way you would have been able to escape racism. There's no way you would have been able to escape a lynching. There's no way you would have been able to escape separate but equal. If it was not for God on the old side, where would you be? Somebody prayed for you. Not just black folk, not just white folk, but somebody prayed for you and snatched you out of the darkness and brought you into the marvelous light where you pray for somebody. Pray for somebody to be great. Pray for somebody to be delivered. Pray for somebody to come to God. I'm telling you right now you're not insignificant because you can pray if you can't talk pray in your mind. Hey! Sign it out. I don't care how you do it but if you pray for somebody you will be significant. You're never insignificant to God. It's God using your prayers. It's God using your prayer life to change somebody's life. Somebody prayed for Saul. Somebody prayed for David. Somebody prayed for Moses. Somebody prayed for Elijah. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody prayed for Josh Myers. Somebody prayed for T.D. Jake. Somebody prayed for Joel Olsen. Somebody prayed for Mother Teresa. Somebody prayed. Somebody prayed for Michael Jordan. Somebody prayed for somebody somewhere. And that's why they made it. Pick somebody that you think is insignificant and pray for them. Pray that God uses them mightily. Pray that God uses them to turn the world upside down. Pray. Pray. Somebody. Somebody. That's a soul. You can pray them into a Paul. Some smelly shepherd boy. You can pray them to be a King David. Some stuttering misfit. You can pray them to be a Moses. Some doubting woman or man of God. You can pray them to be a Gideon. Some weak, scrawny kid. You can pray them to be a Samson. Some messed up mouth person. You can pray them to be an Isaiah. Some crying misfit. You can pray them to be a Jeremiah. Hey, you can pray to him. From a role of insignificance to significance. But can we be unselfish like that? Can we be prayer warriors? Can we be intercessors? See, some of us don't want to pray for because we don't want them to be better than us. Uh, that's why I'm telling you to pray for somebody insignificant. Because you don't think they're going to ever get to where you are. Huh? I'm just keeping it real. 
Pray for somebody. Remember, I, I taught this when we went on the road, and I taught this at Bible study. I believe God calls himself the I am because we say I am so much. We say I this, I that, I'm this, and I can do that. And anything you can do, I can do better. I believe God calls himself the great I am because he's psychologically tapping into our selfish self-righteousness. And he began to say, look here, are you talking about the little I am can do it or are you talking about the big I am can do it? I need you to pray for somebody that you feel is insignificant. Your power can't do it. You're the little I am. But if you pray to the big I am, the big I am can do whatever it is you pray for. Pick somebody. Amen. Pray for them. And watch God begin to do wonders in their life. I had neighbors that prayed for me. I had teachers that prayed for me. I had people that mentored me from afar. People that told me I was called to preach even when I didn't want to hear it. Be that person in somebody's life. Be that person that can just sit there and pray and pray for them every day. Even if you just start off for 30 seconds, build up to a minute, two minutes or whatnot. Just pray for that person every day. Maybe it's your son. Maybe it's your daughter. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's that person in the next cubicle that might get on your nerves tomorrow. Maybe it's a church member. Maybe it's a politician. Maybe it's your crazy pastor. I don't know who it is. Whoever it is, choose that person and pray for them every day. And watch how what you think is so insignificant becomes so significant. Because God wants to show you the power of prayer. Church, we don't become too educated. We got too many doctor degrees, and we think that's what qualifies us. God don't care nothing about my doctor degree. I got a doctor degree for y'all, so y'all can say I was approved. That doctor degree ain't for nobody but church folk and folk in the world. God can use you no matter how uneducated you are. <laughs> 